Uh, welcome to today's webinar, What's New in Dragonfly 21.3. Uh, my name is Mike Marsh. I am the product manager for Dragonfly at ORS. Uh, with me is Nicola Pichet. Say hello, Nicola. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am sitting in my home office in Denver, and Nicola is working out of a home office in Montreal. Nicola is our vice president of research and development. And so we are here to walk you through uh, some of the new features coming out in the Dragonfly 2021.3 release. Now, today's webinar, we will go through a number of slides that include some videos describing some of those new features. The release notes have already been made publicly available, and I'm afraid that we have so many new features, we cannot go through all of them uh, one by one in this format. So we're just going to spotlight some of the ones that we think are most important for you to see, and we'll refer you to the release notes for some of those other features. In this Zoom webinar setting, you do have a Q&A feature. I encourage you to uh, type in and ask your questions when you think of them. At the end, we will have a question and answer session, and then Nicola and I will go through some of those questions. Uh, with all of that, let's go ahead and get started. So our agenda for today is uh, why is this uh, Dragonfly 21.3? Some of you may be on the current production release of 21.1. So we're gonna tell you a little, about the, a little bit about the nomenclature of the releases very quickly. Then we're gonna spotlight some of the new features. And those new features that we'll be talking about today will fall roughly into three categories, data organization, visualization, and deep learning. Lots of new features in this release, but we're gonna focus mostly on some features in those categories. And then finally, we'll tell you about some opportunities for early access to some features for those that wanna collaborate with the ORS team. So I say, why 21.3? Well, first, I'll just mention that we do have a tradition of frequent updates. So some of you have been with us for a long time. Dragonfly 2.0 was launched back in 2016. And you can see that we have periodic updates, uh, nearly two, two to three every year. So it's very uh, likely that if you uh, adopt a license and within the first 12 months, you have one or two new updates. Those updates are always documented with release notes. If you want to see what's been in some of those releases, in case you missed any of those features, you want to learn what's there, you can go to theobjects.com slash dragonfly slash new, and we archive all of our release notes there. These new releases, they're packed. You'll see bug fixes, new features, performance optimizations, code factory, code refactoring and modernization that make the software perform better and make the software easier to maintain and add new features. So always lots to see. These are not minor releases. Every release offers something for almost every Dragonfly user. We launched 21.1 in January of this year. And so you see that we are on a new nomenclature of releases where the first release of every calendar year has the dot one uh, appendix. We quietly released a maintenance update only with 21.2. We did have users who had modernized and upgraded their NVIDIA GPUs from older generations like Pascal and Volta uh, up to the very latest generation Ampere class. And we wanted to get an update out for those users that wanted to be able to use deep learning. And so 21.2 was just a maintenance update. 21.3, is the next update that offers those new features. And so there is a full release notes available for the release that we're talking about today. Now I've talked with the maestro back in the back office and he tells me that they are put, putting the finishing touches and polishing up the installer. So the installer download for 21.3 is not online right now, but it will be going up soon. We will be sending out an email for those of you that are on our email subscription list uh, that gives you access to a recording of this video and will give you a notification of the download link for that 21.3 installer. So keep an eye on your inbox. Let's start talking about some new features. I'm going to first talk about data organization. So we have introduced in Dragonfly almost two years ago a tool called the Dragonfly Organizer or the Project Organizer. This is to help users organize their data and their results so that they can find what they're looking for and have productive Dragonfly sessions. Now, I'm going to show you that what we have done in this newest release is we have uh, completely rebuilt the user interface to make it even more functional and more friendly. 
Um, the data that I'm going to showcase in this organizer are actually publicly available data that we've loaded in Dragonfly and stored in our project organizer. And so I cite up here uh, Dr. Masha Pradanovic over at UT, at University of Texas at Austin, her Digital Rocks Portal initiative. So we were able to download uh, numerous volumes of data from her public, except public repository. So in the organizer, you have, you can think of them as folders or projects, and you can search, show me all my samples with carbonates, or show me all my samples with sandstones. And you can expand to see what do you have in a particular project uh, to see, do I have uh, PDFs, or do I have images, or do I have multi roys And you'll also be able to select projects and add tags. So you might want to mark, oh, these, this is a clastic rock, or this is a sandstone, or this is a plug. You can add another search timer. Now I can see the sandstone cores. So in this user interface, you're able to browse and search for the data and then just drag whatever you want into the user interface. You can also star different projects so they'll stay in the starred list. Your recent projects will show up in the recent projects list. And if you push pin a project, whenever you clear the search results, that push pin project will stay active and visible. So what this gives you is the ability, oh, I think the movie restarted. Let's see if we can advance to the next slide. What this gives you is the same organizer service that we had before, but with a new look that adds functionality. And now we're announcing that it's included for free with every Dragonfly license. This used to be a premium extension that uh, only users who elected to pay extra for the feature were entitled to get it. Now everyone can benefit from the Dragonfly organizer. This is a, a wonderful tool for storing everything associated with your research project. So you store ORS objects, of course, like images and multi roids and meshes, but you also store the associated files, your PDFs, your spreadsheets, your Word docs, anything that's associated with that research project that you wanna be able to find and access. And of course, these convenience tools help you find the right project. You can access your recent projects or your start or your pinned projects. And of course, by putting tags on projects and on files and objects, then you can search by those tags. Now, I do want to point out that the data is not locked away in some uh, arcane uh, uh, encrypted database. The data is there and it's always easy for you to access. The projects, in fact, are just folders. You can copy a project folder, a project folder for a colleague and add it to his or her project root, and then uh, he or she will have organizer access to that project. You can browse project folders with the file explorer and you can archive project folders with the normal backup utilities. So Dragonfly Organizer is completely refactored on the user interface to make it much more user friendly and we think you're really going to like it and it's going to help you streamline your productivity and organize your data. Now on the topic of organizing data, um, we often work with data from different sources or even the same sources that might challenge us to apply regular processing routines. And what I mean by that is data are rarely calibrated by intensity. In fact, CT reconstruction engines, they may be tuned to optimize the dynamic range or satisfy some other constraint, but they often fail to reconstruct the same material at the same grayscale. So consider these three sandstone histograms. This is a sandstone sample called Belgian fieldstone, one, uh, a Bentheimer sandstone and a Plexi sandstone. You can see over here that these come from the digital rocks portal. So the Belgian uh, fieldstone uh, uh, from uh, Tom Boltrace and West of Over, and then the Bentheimer from Tom Rodstad, and then the Plexi from uh, Lauren Beckingham and colleagues. And what you can see when you look at a histogram like this is in every one of these, there's depending on how you count, two or three peaks. There's an air peak, or more precisely, a mask peak, and then two phases, an air phase and a phase for the grains of the sandstone, which are dominated by quartz. Here, they're well resolved. Here, they're overlapping a little bit. And down here, they're overlapping, but pretty well resolved. But what you'll notice is in this case, the air peak may be around 11,000 counts, and here it may be around 14,000, and likewise the quartz may be at a different position. This means when you're working with data, even if they come off the exact same machine, they can have different counts. And it means when you're doing your thresholding and your visualization and your deep learning, it can be quite cumbersome because every data needs slightly retuned processing parameters. Well, we think we should solve this problem. And if you look at clinical CT, clinical CT for uh, patients in hospitals where they're scanning humans, 
they developed a scale uh, a few decades ago for clinical CT where they would say that your air peak should always be minus 1,000 counts and your water peak should be zero counts. And that normalizes, which means when you're looking at data off a of GE or a Siemens or Philips, you can use the same processing routines and expect to get consistent result. Well, Dragonfly now lets you define your own units. You can define your own Hounsfield scale. So for these sandstones, I might want to define the siliciclastic micro CT, where I have a peak for air and I say, let's set air to be zero. So when I have this, let's have this readout as zero and have my quartz readout as 100. So the idea is you can define a scale and then calibrate your data and then they'll all be treated and behave on the same scale. You can define as many intensity scales or units as you want. So you could have one for in vivo bone or one for industrial powder, or you could have one for composites with coatings, really anything you want. It's quite nice because if you share a data set with a colleague, if after they read that data set, they'll have access to that same units definition in their Dragonfly. Now, what we would recommend for good, robust use is determine one set of imaging parameters like a constant beam voltage and beam filter uh, setting, and then set a scale uh, for a single dark material and a single bright material that you expect to observe in every sample or scan every sample with a designated intensity phantom. So in this case, I say my dark phase is air, my bright phase is quartz. And when I set that, and now when I get readouts on these data, you'll see that the air peak is reading out at zero on all three histograms and the quartz peak is reading out at 100. It's important to note that the calibration updates this readout intensity, but it preserves the raw data values. So if the data have very low bit depth, then they'll still be quite coarse. If they have high bit depth, they'll still be quite fine. And the data are not corrupted. In fact, if you save the images and you want to load them in, in ImageJ or some other software, they'll still have the original values. But when you do processing in Dragonfly, Dragonfly will use the calibrated readout values. With these calibrated readout values, this means your visualization becomes consistent, your image segmentation and data processing become robust, and even deep learning models start behaving consistently, even if the histograms look quite different and don't overlap. So these are those three, his, those three sandstone samples I was talking about, and I've plotted them on a visualization scale from minus 50 to 150. So keep in mind, the mode of air is set at zero, and the mode of quartz is set at 100, but of course we have some pixels that are brighter and some pixels that are darker. So I gave myself a, a minus 50 and a plus 50. And so we see a very good range. And you can see that when you plot them all on the same scale, minus 50 to 150 SC UCT units, then you get consistent visualization. So you can bake this into all of your processing workflows and give yourself a system for calibration and routine data processing. Now that's all I'm going to say about data organization. I'm going to move right into visualization and there's just so much to talk about here. I'll start with this. Uh, here's a little video um, that talks about uh, transient uh, uh, planar views. So you can see that when you turn this on, now whenever you move a plane, either a single plane or you grab the crosshairs and move both planes, you know exactly where that view is in the 3D space. So where is this section? it's right here. So you get a, a visual cue. Now you can turn that on or off, but you can, after you, if you want, you can also turn on a 3D cursor. So now I'll move my 3D cursor. Now as I'm, I can see exactly where the, the crosshairs would be in 3D. So you can move these around in the 2D views. And we've had in a while, for a while now in Dragonfly, you can click in the 3D to center on a particular view. So I can center on this one painted grain, and then we can see exactly what that looks like from the different uh, two-dimensional views. All right, now let's uh, oops, uh, move on to another visualization update. So we're looking at that same Belgian sandstone. Uh, and here, what we're doing is we're looking at a new view called non-planar views, in this case for cylinders. So I have a cylinder construct in Dragonfly. That's not new. I, I can adjust the height or the radius of the cylinder and have it adjust my, my 3D view. But now, if I select the cylinder and I select a particular view, I can make it a non-planar view. So now I'm looking at what I like to call the soup can wrapper. I'm looking at the surface of that cylinder unwrapped. Uh, in a particular view. And I can adjust the theta offset, that is, you know, what, what seam do I want to appear on the left? 
and I can adjust the radius up and down uh, in my uh, view, either by adjusting the cylinder or just by dragging those text presenters. Uh, I also want to note that you can move the crosshairs in the non-planar view and you can paint. So if you want to segment some grains in the surface view, so if you're trying to segment surface defects or surface grains, you can use this view. And of course, you'll see it painted in the corresponding 3D rendering or any of the normal Cartesian views. So this is a new extension in Dragonfly enabling the non-planar view, in this case for cylinders. Now, if we look, we can also see non-planar view for spheres. So here's a micro CT data set of a mouse femur. This comes from uh, Tim Ryan at Penn State. What I'm doing right now is I'm just placing a point set annotation on the, oh gosh, what do you call this? I'm not an anatomist on the, this ball and socket that fits right in the hip. I don't know what you, you call this sphere on the top of the bone. I'm just uh, putting a bunch of points on that surface. If you have a point set in Dragonfly, you can right click and say, hey, please fit a sphere to this. And now there's a sphere mapped right through uh, the interpolated position of those points. So you can see I've got a sphere mapped right onto the surface. And if you select that sphere and you select a view, then you can ask for the non-planar view of a sphere. So much like looking at a map of the globe, you can have a, a projection. And so you can spin the globe, but you can also, there's not really a well-defined North Pole, so you can adjust the phi and the theta. There's also an alternate mode, the, uh, the equirectangular projection. And again, you can still adjust the phi and the theta. So this gives you views of a spherical sur surface. And again, you can paint and follow the crosshairs for your spherical surface. All right, let's go to the next slide. So our non-planar views, I showed you the cylinder, which I call the soup can wrapper. I showed you the sphere, which is a map-like projection of a spherical surface. And I also, uh, uh, well, I didn't show you, but we also have a plane. So if you have a plane or a feature that should be planar, but it deviates from a plane because it's warped or it has a curve, you can now deform a plane and then see the non-planar view of that plane. You can see it projected and uh, onto a flat plane. As I mentioned, you get correspondence with the standard view. So you can trace the 3D cursor in these non-planar views and see the corresponding position in the standard Cartesian coordinate views. And as I mentioned, you can perform segmentation. Here's another look at a cylinder where you might want to look at the inner surface and see defects as they appear on that inner surface, which are going to be very hard to see just by cross-sectional views. So you can see some of the power of this was, this is not an outer soup can wrapper. This is maybe an inner surface, but you get the idea of a cylinder surface. The next topic in my list is updates to the window leveling and lookup table and how they've been integrated. Now, I do not have a video to show you on this today. I'm afraid there's so much here that for me to unpack all of it, it's going to take about a 15 to 20 minute video, which I'll go ahead and produce uh, uh, here in the coming days. Uh, I will mention a few things here. The ability to adjust how colors are mapped onto the histogram has been made much easier and much more flexible. It's very easy to add and remove color nodes, to change the color node, to create split colors. And you can adjust these colors and how they're mapped either onto the, uh, onto the window or onto the full histogram. You can also adjust new opacity settings. So you can see instead of having a straight linear ramp, you can have a, custom a customized uh, alpha function curve. So you have alpha control points and color control points. And you're able, of course, to modify and save these lookup tables. Something else you can do now is you can pin a window leveling uh, plug in to the desktop, which means if you want to work on three or four data sets at the same time and you want to see the window leveling for all of them and be able to adjust all of them at the same time, you can do that now rather than having the window leveling uh, only be able to show the selected image channel. So that gives you some flexibility where you can not have to toggle your selection back and forth and still be able to maintain and update. So you're going to see this makes, makes it super powerful to get just the color rendering you want on your image data, both in 2D and 3D. Now for uh, uh, 3D, oh, maybe that slide comes later. For 3D visualization, we have also added a new feature on meshes. So we've introduced surface capping on meshes. So you can see that when you normally have a mesh, when you cut through, you just see back to the, the next surface. So you might see uh, the holes or gaps. So here you see this hollow. With surface capping turned on, it creates a solid plane 
which is and can be a preferred visualization technique for uh, many, many modalities. So now that's been added to Dragonfly. Um, I will add that for, in addition to those window leveling and lookup table updates and edits, we've also uh, streamlined the opacity modes or uh, how alpha intensity is encoded in Dragonfly renderings. So I was mentioning that for 3D, you can have a piecewise function where you put arbitrary points uh, to define your curve, or you can stick with a traditional linear ramp. So uh, just like you saw in previous releases of Dragonfly, we have a linear ramp. This is what's called the left gated ramp, and this is the bi gated ramp. So it goes zero to 100%, and then you get set the two endpoints. You can also do uh, what we call the band pass ramp, which uh, on both sides of the window, it goes to zero intensity. And all these behaviors are documented. And so uh, you see the addition of the piecewise, which gives you full customization of your alpha curve. So this is streamlined and this occurs over in uh, along with the LUT editor and the window level uh, widget. So you go over and look at the window level and control panel and it's all right there for you to maintain for both your 2D and 3D views. We've also updated how some of the annotations appear on screen for both 2D and 3D. So now if you make rulers and you want to view those rulers in 3D with a particular offset, so maybe you're measuring a particular diameter or distance on this titanium implant, and if it's just superimposed on the bone, you might not see it, but if you pull it out, now you can see it. So you have these pullouts for rulers. Uh, so you can see pullouts for rulers here, but you'll also see that our on-screen annotations, such as arrows, can now have a drop shadow to give them a little more clarity, make them a little sharper. Our on-screen text annotations are very easy to format, and now you can add background colors with varying opacity. This means you can make really high-quality uh, annotations, either for 2D or for movies. Uh, something I don't have any slides in here, we've also updated our scale bar behavior so you can have more varieties of scale bars to match your style needs when preparing manuscripts with scale bars. So we're seeing updates to the rulers and the scale bars and the on-screen arrows and the on-screen text. Lots of updates to the visualization, not of the data in this case, but of the metadata or the annotations. So a really terrific way to view your data. Um, here's another piece of eye candy you can throw in when making renderings. Now, the virtual floor, which we introduced in a previous release of Dragonfly, has been enhanced to enable reflection. So you can turn on the virtual floor and turn on reflection to create uh, sort of that artistic piece that you might want to use to hang on the wall or put on the cover or maybe just uh, use as your wallpaper for your, for your desktop. So have fun with reflection on virtual floor. All right. Uh, I've said what I wanted to say about data organization and about visualization. Uh, now let's talk about some of the enhancements for deep learning. So the segmentation wizard, which we introduced, I think back in 2020.1 or maybe it was 2020.2, segmentation wizard is uh, continuing to get stronger and remarkably powerful. Uh, we have uh, overhauled the user interface for frame management in the segmentation wizard. So now uh, the buttons to add frame are clearly uh, annotated. The uh, import, you can import multi ROIs from external sources. And if you've made your segmentations in these fr frames and you now wish to save them as a multi ROI so you can ac access them outside the segmentation wizard, we've now made that functionality. Of course, a normal button to delete the frames you're, you don't need to work with at the time. And we've also added uh, this button that looks like a, a histogram button. This allows you to see the statistics in each frame. So if you have four or five different materials and you want to know, do I have a good balance of my different labels? Or uh, maybe I have very strong imbalance, like I'm trying to segment cracks, but maybe cracks only occur 0.1% of all labeled pixels. You can very quickly get a view of the class statistics uh, on a frame by frame or on the aggregate. So that's very powerful. You also have the, the normal tools to turn on and off the visibility of the frames in your view and toggle which ones you want to be used anytime you click the train button. We've improved the model management uh, along with some new recommended models in the model generator or the model stra uh, generator strategy. So we'll see a little bit of that in the next movie. We've also um, made the data augmentation controls very accessible and friendly. 
Basically, you can control the experts who want to fine tune their deep learning models in Segmentation Wizard now have almost all of the same access to controls that they had in the deep learning tool. So it's very easy to update your patch size or your stride ratio, your loss function, et cetera. And you can toggle all of the parameters associated with data augmentation. So uh, if you're looking for more control, it's there. Uh, but if you don't want it, you can always use the defaults and get really terrific results. Now, here's a look at my favorite new feature. And we're getting close to the end of, of today's webinar content. This is my favorite new feature in Dragonfly 21.3. It's called Visual Feedback. And it's there in both the Segmentation Wizard and in the Deep Learning tool. Um, what we have here is some serial block-based SEM of some neural tissue. And suppose I want to do a two-phase segmentation of mitochondria versus background. Let me make this go full screen. So here I have a single frame of training data, something I spent about three or four minutes painting out. So, you know, you can try harder than I did for this demo if you want to get good segmentation, but we'll see what, what kind of results you can get from just uh, a single frame of training. Now, I can always add a new frame, but now I can designate the frame for visual feedback by clicking this button and turning this frame white, and I've actually labeled it for my own information. Now, when I click train, I see I've got more model strategies. I'm going to choose this uh, single model two, which is a three slice unit. Now, what we're seeing right here is 18 minutes of training collapsed down into 30, 30 or 40 seconds. So this is greatly accelerated. This is about 20 minutes on the clock. And what you can see is instead of just observing the loss function, now after every epoch, you get an update based on that visual feedback frame. And you can say, how good a job am I doing? How good is it learning? It was picking up all this myelin as, as mitochondria, and now it's pretty much learned to reject that. It's struggling with this long, thin mitochondria. But if you look, we don't really have any, anything representative of that in our training data. And now after I hit stop, I've turned off the speed up and you can see what the model predicts for this frame. So very good agreement with our training and what it predicts for this frame. Pretty good answer. Just failed on that one long thin mitochondria. Um, now, what this shows you is instead of relying just on that loss function and seeing the loss function as a number fall, you can visually assess. So it's not going to go as fast for you because it's those updates are going to probably happen every 45 seconds or every one minute. Remember that that was sped up. We just saw 20 minutes in about a minute and a half. Now, uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, here we're look, gonna look at the silicon carbide, silicon carbide ceramic matrix composite, a chemical vapor infiltration uh, CMC. And in this case, we're gonna look at five phases. So in this data set, I have one entire half frame designated as training. And I'll pan and zoom and find another area and say, okay, this sees all of the different phases. Let's use this for my visual feedback. And now I can go ahead and name it visual feedback and I can uh, click train. So here you see I've got five phases, exterior, EBC, poor, silicon fiber, silicon carbide matrix. So I pick a model, I hit continue, and now it starts training. Now uh, you can see in the early epochs, it's, it's lousy. It takes a while to learn. So here at epoch 9, 10, 11, 12, and you see it's still struggling, but you see the loss function continuing to fall. It's starting to pick up the fibers. It's starting to pick up the silicon carbide matrix. Now it's starting to look about right, and here we are about 30 or 35 epochs in. So once you get to a satisfactory result, you can either let it finish on its own, or I'm going to pause this video. You can either let it finish on its own, uh, or you can stop it early if you're satisfied with the results. Now, if you're doing this on your own machine, you can also drag this yellow bar to the left and to the right, and you can observe uh, uh, if back, what did a previous state look like? Is it, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? So you can see that history. And after the model is fully trained and you hit stop, these frames, these preview frames, and this loss function are preserved. So you can go back and inspect that training history. So I'll go ahead and resume this video. So here it, it finishes training. This is about 20 minutes of, of compute time. And, uh, and that's, and now we can kind of look and see how well it learned. So this is the prediction it made on this frame. Um, I think I'll go and I'll look at the other frame. Uh, and this is the, the training frame. And this is how well it learned to reproduce uh, the training frame. So you see that uh, it's doing a remarkable job of learning without that much time. Now, that brings me to some discussion. Uh, so 
as I mentioned, you can always review the training history on, on trained models and you can scroll through. But if you enable it in your preferences, you can have checkpoints saved. So you can say, save the best five or six models you actually allocate in disk space. Save the best 500 megabytes of models. So if I want to go back to a previous model, if I thought that was doing a better job, you can actually restore and revert to that state and then either use that for future training or just use that as your, as your final permanent model. So this visual feedback is really powerful at letting you see how the training is going. So we have other segmentation enhancements. So we have migrated from TensorFlow 1.14 to TensorFlow 2.4. That's what we have under the hood driving the deep learning uh, tool chain in Dragonfly. This makes it faster. It adds support for more custom layers and more loss functions. So that you'll see those coming from us, but you can add those uh, as a user as well. And we have also accelerated the data augmentation in Dragonfly. Now you can nearly saturate the processing pipe on your GPU. So you, you buy an expensive GPU and you can really uh, see it, it crunching. And you can see that as you're training some of these deep learning models, it's taking full advantage of the GPU and really generating that training uh, very quickly. So um, that's what I was going to show. Uh, I will mention in my last, uh, my, my almost last slide, that we would encourage those that want to reach out and collaborate with us. We have a couple of new features that we can provide early access to. One is called feature analysis. So some of you may know the objects analysis in Dragonfly. This is more or less a refactoring of objects analysis, but it, it works not only for multi roys but also meshes and graphs. So with objects analysis, you build a table of volume and surface area and aspect ratio on a multi roy but now you can build uh, tables of measurements and properties on meshes and graphs. You can also aggregate data tables from multiple experiments. So if you're doing lots of cells and you wanna aggregate the mitochondria for multiple 3D reconstructions, or you're scanning lots of powder samples and you wanna aggregate the statistics from multiple scans, you can. Further, you can start to design classifiers that learn the different measurement signatures. If, I'm, if it turns out I have three different types of mitochondria, maybe those that are performing one function in one type of cell and those that are performing another function or another type of cell, maybe Dragonfly can start to learn and say, oh, you know what? It's a combination of volume and aspect ratio along with these three other attributes and you can start to classify. Uh, so that's very powerful. If you would like to get early access and learn how to use this feature, uh, just reach out uh, and you can just email sales at theobjects.com and you can get early access to this. We also have distributed deep learning. So if you want to train multiple deep learning models at the same time on a GPU cluster, if you want to take your deep learning inference tasks and add them to a queue of distributed jobs, so you can just add more and more jobs and then let the GPU cluster process them when it, when it becomes available, you can take advantage of that. You can even split your, your deep learning inference among multiple GPU nodes. So if you've got a 200 gigabyte channel and you don't want to wait on one node to finish it, maybe you can split it into four chunks and have four nodes process it in four times uh, the speed. So uh, if you're interested, um, we'll have to send you a, a patch and documentation. We can collaborate so you can have some early access to distributed deep learning. All right. I should be winded. I've been talking for 35 minutes, and I think that's all I want to talk about today. Let me just refer you to the release notes. So we have so much packed in this release, and I've talked about a lot of it, but there's still a lot I haven't talked about. We have Besides our intensity scale calibration, we've added some new tools to support spatial scale calibration, make sure you get the pixel size right. We've added tools to make it easier to do your objects analysis and your multi-ROI processing with these tools called Scalar Generator, working not just for multi-ROIs, but for meshes and graphs. We've made updates to our SEM simulator, our MC X-Ray. We've added updates on the ROI painter and how to use and color code your uh, regions of interest into lookup tables in for um, enhanced 2D visualization. And we've got updates on shapes and movie maker and the screen recorder, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sorry I don't have time to talk about all of these, but uh, that gives you uh, some idea of what's new in Dragonfly 21.3. All right, Nicola, are you still there with me? Yes, I am. <clears throat> all right. it's, it's so hard to just talk into the void for half an hour and no, no, I was there listening. <laughs> no, no, all of all of our participants were there listening too as well. That's terrific. 
All right, Nicola, um, can you maybe look over some of the Q&A? I see that some of our viewers have uh, typed in some questions. Are there any questions there that uh, we should take up at this time? Yeah, I think so. I have answered a couple of them. Um, well, I was not sure what was the status now of the using multiple GPU on the same machine. Ah, right. Well, you if you have multiple GPUs on the machine and you want to use it for uh, deep learning, you can choose which GPU to use. You cannot use both GPUs or multiple GPUs for training uh, at this time. So uh, that may come in the future. Now for rendering, if you have multiple GPUs and they're exactly the same GPU, there are settings you can change for both Windows and Linux to enable faster rendering in a multi-GPU setup. So um, I believe it's in the documentation uh, on how to enable multi-GPU setup, but it's not a Dragonfly setting, it's an operating system setting, but feel free to email support at theobjects.com to ask how you can take advantage of multiple GPUs for rendering. Uh, are there any more questions? Well, uh, a question about the vir virtual floor, is it possible to change the size of the virtual floor in the rendering? Ah, that's a good question. I think it's automatically scaled for you. Um, and, but we could, uh, if you email support at theobjects.com, we'll get a definitive answer. And if you have a suggestion for what you would like to see on how to control the virtual floor settings, uh, then feel free to email us so we can uh, take advantage of that and consider it for a future update. Okay. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, do we know when the pro version will be available? Ah, so those of you that are looking for Dragonfly Pro 21 or 2021.3, um, if you are a new user and you wish to evaluate, then you will get that from uh, directly from the Zeiss support team. And uh, we do not have their schedule, but it will still be a few weeks. If you are an existing Dragonfly Pro user and you have a support plan with us, then we can uh, provide you with an update. Um, if you are covered under maintenance and support, we can give you the Dragonfly Pro update uh, as, a, as that release candidate becomes available. And that will be at the same time that we make the installer available for Dragonfly. So when you get that email announcement saying that the uh, here is a recording of this video and here is the where you can access a download link, we will also be able to support Dragonfly Pro 21.3 download links at that time. Um, are there any change in the 3D DL possibility? Is there a tutorial on how to train 3D model? Mm. So uh, it's a good question about deep learning and training 3D models. So in Dragonfly 21.3, you have the ability to train what we might describe as three different types of models, at least if you're considering dimensionality. So the standard model might be a single slice 2D model, which we just call a 2D model. And that only looks at a single slice at a time when deciding how to label the individual pixels. We have models, it's, it can be a little bit confusing and we will clear up this language in the next update. It can be a little bit confusing. The next mode is sometimes called 3D and it will say number of slices. And in that case, you can use a model that looks at a 2D patch when deciding how to label the pixels, but it will also look in the previous slice and the following slice, or three previous slices and three following slices. So that's what I would describe as a multi-slice 2D model or a 2.5 dimensional model. You have that capacity in Dragonfly, um, and it doesn't have to be symmetric. It doesn't have to be the previous slice and the following slice. It could be the five previous slices plus the slice in question. Uh, and then you also have true 3D models, such as Unit 3D. And that will actually take an entire 3D patch, and it uses 3D convolutional kernels. So that uses a 3D patch, which could be 32 by 32 by 32 pixels. I think it can also be asymmetric, like 32 by 32 by 16 pixels. You have some control to set that patch size. And for the experts among you, you know, you'll have to pay attention to the depth uh, because the patch size will constrain how far you can go in max pooling layers. So you have the capacity to do 2D, the multi-slice 2D and the true 3D models. And all of those are available in Dragonfly 21.3. 
Um, as far as recommending uh, when to use them, um, the UNET 3D gets fantastic results. Uh, it, it almost always gets uh, results and they can be marginally better than the multi-slice models or much better, depending on the complexity of your data and how much information the interpretation of data needs from those neighboring slices. However, it's much slower than training two-dimensional models. So you have to decide, do I want to pursue the 3D model because I think it's going to give me the best results, or do I not need, need it because the 2D is good enough and it will train much faster? However, I will mention one more thing <laughs> just to complicate this. Um, we have greatly accelerated a number of the tools in the deep learning, and so now the UNET 3D is much faster at training than it was before. So uh, we encourage you to use Segmentation Wizard and train two or three models at the same time. That is, choose a 2D model and a multi-slice 2D model and a 3D model, train them all for a few hours, compare the results, and if the UNET 3D is far out in front, you have a direct visual comparison. Then you can cancel the other two models and pursue training with the UNET 3D. So that's the power of Segmentation Wizard is being able to experiment with multiple uh, architectures and multiple models at the same time from the same training data. All right, do we have any more questions, Nicola? <clears throat> yes, a lot of them. I'm not sure uh, it's all easy to answer, but uh, um, let me see. Um, instant segmentation. Uh, for now, uh, we don't have anything for that. <clears throat> um, uh, that's true. The, so for instance segmentation, we've done some experiments. Um, we've also seen some promising results in the literature for instance segmentation. Uh, we've done the experiments, but we've not put anything um, in place for production use. The, uh, so the, the short answer is there's no instance segmentation in Dragonfly. But over the next year, we will continue experiments on instance segmentation of objects like grains, like rock grains and powder grains, but also instance segmentation on fibers, uh, maybe even on pores. So we continue to do research, but we don't have any update for you at this time on instance segmentation. Maybe we could list the new for file format that we support in the, <clears throat> uh, in the reconstruction plugin. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know them. Uh, that was a question. So, of course, Dragonfly offers a CT reconstruction engine for users that want to use it. So if you want to perform cone beam reconstruction for your laboratory CT uh, or even for uh, neutron CT, or if you want to do parallel ray reconstruction for synchrotron CT, you can do that in Dragonfly and you can do iterative reconstruction and you can do reconstruction um, accelerated on the GPU. Those are all features of the CT reconstruction engine in Dragonfly. Um, with this release, we have added support for more file formats. So um, uh, I think we have GE and Scanco now. Uh, uh, Scanco, okay. And uh, do we have Skyscan now too? I think. I'm so, not sure. Uh, sorry, we'll have to. We'll have to. We, if you want to send me an email on the question of what file formats do we support for CT reconstruction, uh, then you can email me or you can email support at theobjects.com. Uh, but I think you'll you'll see some file formats that we offer like North Star Imaging and KA Imaging and now GE and it looks like maybe Scanco and maybe Skyscan. So uh, if you're interested in using that reconstruction engine, uh, it's you can always use it without the file format support as long as you know how to import the projections and you know the geometry. The file format support just it makes it easier for you to key in the, the proper uh, parameters. So whether we have the support for the file format or not, you're still welcome to experiment with the reconstruction engine. Ellie is asking about, uh, will it be possible in the future to do object detection with Dragonfly? Well, uh, that's a good question. So uh, we, we did ship object detection in 21.1. Uh, and it's available there. And so we can give you some help or point you to the documentation on how to train object detection. I believe the object detection is all 2D. So if you're trying to find objects in a large field of view, like a large area 2D SEM, um, and, and uh, put boxes around them, that's something you can do. We've also added new features to make it easier to train object classifiers and object detectors. So it didn't come out in, uh, in the release notes, and it wasn't in today's. Uh, talk, but there are uh, new capabilities related to object detection. So you can contact us offline 
uh, we're, we're very eager to hear how uh, scientific imaging researchers would like to use object detection in their research. And the more case studies we hear, the better we can be informed about making a productive user interface so that other users can, can uh, integrate that into their scientific imaging. Kevin is asking if we can move measures in 3D <coughs> independently of the data set it was produced from. Oh, yeah, great question. So um, Dragonfly's coordinate system is extremely powerful. You can view your coordinate system from any particular angle, but you can also manipulate all of your data objects independently, which means you can have an image and from your image, you can derive a region of interest. From your region of interest, you can derive a mesh and you can also put rulers in the coordinate system. All of those objects can be moved and rotated independently or uh, as groups. So you can uh, pull meshes, you can animate meshes into different positions or, or just uh, uh, displace them. We have a tool in Dragonfly called the uh, Translate Rotate plugin that allows you to select any object and then drag it in any of the NPR views uh, to, to translate it. Uh, or you could rotate it uh, on the axis normal to that view. So yes, you can absolutely manipulate uh, meshes and change their orientation or their position. Okay. Um, there one, there's one question from Robert from Bass. <clears throat> Currently, each time you click train, it save over the models on the first epoch. Now that I save multiple models, will it, it now only save over the model in the first epoch? as a better value loss than the last time you trained the same model? Right, so the behavior of the deep learning uh, iteration, it goes a little bit like this. The first time you create a neural network model, it is instantiated with random weights. At the conclusion of the first training epoch, those weights will have some values. And then at the conclusion of the second epoch, they will have updated values. And at each epoch we evaluate has the val loss function fallen. Um, after the training is complete, either because you hit the stop button or because early stopping was triggered or because the full uh, directive of 100 or however many epochs has completed, what will happen is the last, uh, the epoch that gave the lowest val loss is the epoch that is used and all of those weights are used. So anytime you hit train, you are uh, taking the chance that you will overwrite your model with an updated and better model. If the val loss values do not fall, then it will not overwrite. You can export models and you can duplicate models if you don't want to overwrite or lose a model that is already good. So that's the behavior is if the scoring function says this model is better, then it will overwrite the, the weights and the coefficients in the previous uh, iteration of that model. The models are quite heavy. So you have uh, you know, on the order of 20 to 80 million free parameters in these models. So they take up uh, many, many megabytes, uh, sometimes a quarter or a half gigabyte. And so um, it is not, uh, practical to store and save the model after every single epoch, or else you'll quickly run out of disk space. So we are forced to make a choice of when to overwrite, and we overwrite whenever the scoring function says it gets better. Although with the new caching mechanism, you can have it save the 10 best models or the, the five best models, and you can roll it back to one of the previous saved states. So that's a little bit about how the model uh, the, how the models are preserved and, and iterated and updated over successive training epochs. Was that the last question, Nicola? One last, okay. Eduardo is asking, uh, is saying wonderful visual feedback feature. Can the user access the intermediate visual frame together with the progress plot when the training is over? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, so anytime you have a model in your model library, you can right click on it and say display training history. And every time you hit train, it logs a new training history. And if you use a visual feedback, then you will see the plot and you will see the visual feedback frame and you can scroll through them. If you did not use a visual feedback, you still have the history of loss function. You still have a table of uh, loss and val loss and any other scores you elected to compute. 
So you do have that history. Um, furthermore, if you wanted to, those visual frames are stored on the disk as a, as a multi roid so they could be accessible if you needed to. They're, we don't make them accessible in the user interface, but they are on disk if you wanted to see those visual frames uh, and use them to make some sort of annotation or make some sort of uh, communication in a paper or a lab meeting. So those are on the disk and they are saved and archived. Okay, well, I hope you all like uh, visual feedback as much as I do. Um, let me give one last note. Uh, everything I showed today that wasn't related to deep learning is available for all Dragonfly users. None of those tools I showed require any special premiums or any special extensions. They're all unlocked for all Dragonfly users. Everything I showed with Segmentation Wizard and deep learning is restricted to users that have deep learning. So we do still have some users of Dragonfly and Dragonfly Pro that don't have the deep learning extension. But of course, we're happy to uh, provide you with a license. That's uh, you can contact sales at theobjects.com to get a, a trial license for deep learning. Or if you know you're ready to purchase it, we can sell that to you. So everything I've shown to you today is accessible for users of Dragonfly with deep learning. And if you don't have deep learning, well, you can use all those new features except the deep learning. So stay tuned to your email so you'll know when the download link is ready. And we look forward to getting more feedback and talking to you next time. We'll have, we've got more events and more activity coming this fall. So check your email and uh, always stay in touch. Nicola, is there any, anything you want to say before we go? Well, uh, I'm happy that, uh, that uh, as much people were present and a uh, very good presentation, Mike. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for uh, directing the team and getting such uh, amazing results. Uh, this is a really terrific release. All the releases are amazing. And uh, I, commend, uh, I commend you all to read the release notes and even check out previous release notes because you may have missed features. We don't always uh, do a webinar and tell you about the new features, but we're always, uh, always giving you fresh updates. With that, we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you all for your time and your interest, and we look forward to being in touch with you in the future. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>